Um, so I come as a, as a completely sort of non-expert in any of this, apart from the experience that I've had over the last, getting on for 10 years now, in, in this area of healthcare informatics. Uh, my background is I trained as a doctor and then as a psychiatrist. I still do some clinical practice looking after um, fairly elderly people in Croydon. And, um, and my research background is in epidemiology, so I'm used to the idea of sort of big populations and collecting information on, um, on that sort of community sample. And it's been an interesting process moving into the sort of different data that accrue in, in, um, in routine healthcare records. Um, but, and in mental health, I think we've, in some ways, we've got a bit of an advantage in this area because we've always had to slightly think outside the box. So the measurements that we're interested in don't come um, laid out for us very easily. So if you're involved in community studies of mental health, you've got to devise questionnaires that can actually really capture how people are feeling and the, all the complexities of um, people's lives and daily circumstances, um, as opposed to perhaps, say, cardiovascular disease where you can just measure blood pressure and some blood tests and, and that's the data already there for you. And likewise, within our records, as I'll, I'll go on to sort of talk about just as a sort of case study within healthcare data, um, we've had to think quite sort of carefully and, and I believe innovatively about um, how to make the best um, of data science in a, in, a, in a sort of difficult and challenging area and therefore have taken it perhaps further than um, our fellows in other specialties have done because we've had to. So for me, um, as a researcher in healthcare, um, there's been a traditional distinction for quite some time between research data, which are collected um, you know, on a relatively small number of people, um, but in a, in a sort of quite a lot of depth, and then an administrative data where you might have a national a national sort of um, database of, of healthcare contacts where you get very large numbers in the database uh, but not an awful lot of information on those people. And where health records sit is, is kind of quite new for us. Um, we haven't really had this before. The idea of databases that are both very, very detailed on individuals, which obviously a person's health record is theoretically, um, if you can actually sort of access the information, there's a lot of it there potentially, um, and available on potentially large numbers of people. If you think about all the health records in the NHS, that is a very big database. It's a very inaccessible database. It isn't even one. It's distributed in any number of sort of different areas, and that's part of the problem that the NHS has of, of information sitting in all sorts of areas and the it's seemingly impossible complexity of putting it all together. Uh, but that's what we have to deal with. Um, this will all be familiar for you. These are, this is the sort of seven V's version of big data. Um, I think in healthcare, veracity is, is perhaps one of the sort of key ones on that list, which is obviously simply sort of the information and its, and its sort of provenance and how it came to get there in the record. And if you're using that for research, can you actually use it? Is it reliable enough? Has it been influenced by management sort of orientated decisions? Um, as opposed to a research study where you can actually collect the information dispassionately. Any administrative data is usually there for a reason, and you have to be quite careful of that. In terms of um, our point of view, volume is not a huge problem for us because we, you know, we have sufficient sort of compute capacity to deal with healthcare databases and databases derived from that. Um, it will become, I think, a bit more of an issue as time goes on and we move to sort of real-time processing. And there are lots of different types of data and, and all sorts of bits of information from different sources coming together. So variety is, is a challenge, but, um, but those, I think veracity is perhaps the key one and is the one that's sort of most um, difficult to um, get through in some ways. So just a little bit about the actual, where I work and, and what we work with. Um, so this is the catchment area, that yellow thing there is the catchment area of um, the South London and Maudsley Trust, which is our local mental health provider. Um, one of the largest mental health services in Europe, possibly the largest, um, covering those four boroughs of Lambeth, Suffolk, Lewisham and Croydon, um, local to here, and um, providing all services to that as well as some sort of national centres um, for sort of specialist care with a, with a broader catchment area. So we've had electronic health records for quite some time, 
And since, and it, it's a sort of bit of an accident, you probably, as you may know, GPs have had fully electronic health records the longest, and I remember the old days of general practice notes, you went in and they'd bring out these little brown envelopes and, and have all the sort of cards inside. Um, and then they went sort of computerized quite a while ago. Mental health was really the second wave. It was a bit of an accident, really. It was at the time that Tony Blair's government were trying to push through this big NHS IT program that failed so miserably. But one of the odd byproducts was that mental health services were all forced to go electronic. Um, so we've had it for a while. Other hospital services are now going electronic, and possibly most have now. But um, we, we've had it longest. We were lucky at the South London and Maudsley because we got in there early and built our own system. Um, and that enabled us to build this um, database that I'll be talking about because we had full control over everything and we didn't have to sort of go to industry partners to um, who where uh, now that other trusts are beginning to get out of those original rather difficult contracts that they used to be in with their providers um, they're now a bit more free to sort of develop these systems and it's going to be probably a, a sort of widening thing um, as we go forward. This is really to emphasize that, I mean, in my view, using data in, in healthcare is, is really mostly about governance. I don't think that the technicalities are actually huge. It's actually about can you do it in a way that's trustworthy, in a way that's sort of appropriate, in a way that's overseen properly. Because obviously, well, for obvious reasons, these are sensitive things, mental health records perhaps particularly sensitive. Um, so, you know, when we, when we began the process of thinking, could we make a database out of mental health records? How are we going to do it? The fact that we developed a system for automatically de-identifying the record um, was, was just really sort of less than half of the process. That involved a bit of thinking and a bit of sort of engineering and making sure that we could identi de-identify things properly. But it was much more an issue of um, putting the right framework in place for how we're going to use the data uh, when it comes out, having had the identifiers stripped out and being effectively sort of anonymized. And the key thing for us was that we let patients lead that from the outset. So we, we put the whole governance process in charge of patient representative groups and said, well, what sort of governance would you like around this? What, what do you think the structures should be? And that's where our governance model comes from, and that's where it continues to be led from. So we have an oversight committee that looks at every single project that uses this database that we call CRIS, Clinical Record Interactive Search, um, and um, looks at and approves, checks to see whether the, you know, there might be any problem with sort of accidentally um, identifying people from, from the database or these, these sorts of type of things. All the data is contained within the same zone of uh, the electronic firewall as the source clinical records. Um, so it, it has the same sort of procedures around it as the original records do. And there are various things like sort of who, who can use it and, and auditing the, um, the projects that use it. And only really at the point when, find, when the paper research paper gets written does it come out of the firewall and go for publication, uh, making sure that there's nothing identifiable in there. So it's, it's not just a matter of sort of one technical solution. It needs to be in the context of a, of a wider governance model. So this is the clinical record interactive search, and it's relatively sort of simple. It sort of goes from the uh, patient record and, does, and runs through various pipelines to structure it, um, to remove the identi identifying material from it, um, and then renders it available for researchers to make databases out of. And we now have about sort of 280,000 odd people represented on that system, um, about 35,000 of whom are sort of active, receiving active care at any given time, um, and quite a lot of information as, as healthcare databases go. And we have sort of two outputs. One is a relatively easy to use one for um, clinicians particularly come in and want rather sort of simple databases for clinical audits and that sort of type of thing, and then, and then there's a, a SQL output uh, which is used for the more sort of complicated research-based querying. Um, and I should say, the, in terms of security, we have an opt-out model, so um, if anyone sort of is concerned about be, their records being on CRIS, they can, just, they can let us know and we can blank that out. 
Only three people so far have taken up that option. Um, we have publicized it widely. We regularly go around patient groups saying this is what's happening to your records. Um, and it will happen one day, but in sort of eight to ten years of explaining the project to any number of people, I have yet to have, a, have had a negative comment from patient groups or other things. So um, I'm sure you know someone will at some point. Mostly people assume it's happening anyway with health records. Um, and um, the, ma the main concerns are all about, well, is the information good enough for you? Is my doctor recording the right information? Which is you know, quite a reasonable thing to, to expect and making sure that we're not sort of making uh, sort of false assumptions from, from these databases, which again is, is, is reasonable. Um, but the, you know, the process goes on. We just could keep sort of letting people know as much as possible about this. Um, and it, so far it's, it's been okay. Uh, so that was where we started, and a lot of the work over the last um, you know, five to six years or so at least um, has been about um, improving the functionality from simply being able to access records within one um, service, albeit on large numbers of people. So we wanted to be able to link this to other databases, and have been able to do that, um, again, relatively straightforwardly. Mostly it's about trust, governance, um, you know, arguing the case that the linkage is, is a useful thing to do. So just from simply being able to, I'll just sort of show a few sort of examples of research output from this, um, simply being able to access our own records. NMS stands for Neuroleptic Malignant Syndrome. It's, a, it's quite a rare but potentially fatal um, side effect of certain medications that people receive for psychotic disorders. It's rather important. Um, we were able to do a keyword search across all our records and identify about 60 or 70 people that had experienced this, which turned out to be about one of the largest numbers internationally ever, ever collected of this particular thing. And then we were able to look at what sorts of medications people were on. It didn't seem to be across the group. and It seemed to be particular agents that were particularly responsible um, for this syndrome. Um, and so that's an important thing that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Um, because you can't simply sort of wait and for, for people to have this rather rare syndrome. Uh, you've got to look at it somehow across records, and until you have a system like Chris, you can't do that. So it's really important for drug safety. Um, that's just sort of showing the um, inverse relationship between wealth and severe mental illness where people live in our boroughs, and that, that's relatively easily done from the, from the source database. Um, but we were able to set up a clinical data linkage service to provide secure ways of bringing databases together without compromising. You need to use identifiers for this, but without compromising anonymity, and there's various ways in which one can do that, um, making sure that no one actually sees either end of the process and that the, the linkage is done and the data are brought together and no one actually sort of sees the full um, thing with the identifiers. So we linked to mortality records, and this was a, and it enables us to sort of big beginner, what is now quite a long-running sort of piece of work, looking at the extremely poor life expectancy experienced by um, the people that we treat, uh, which is about sort of between 10 and 20 years lower than it should be, and is it about the level that you would see in North Korea and Bangladesh? That's, what, that's the life expectancy of someone with a serious mental illness that we treat. And so that obviously then leads into all sorts of issues about health inequalities, which, which again, these, these records are particularly helpful for. So we could look within the um, sample and, and see in this case that what a, what a doctor said about your risk of suicide and violence didn't really predict mortality at all, but what they said about your risk of self-neglect did quite a lot. Um, so it seems to be the kind of despite the fact that mental health services run around particularly a lot about trying to prevent suicide and violence, and that's kind of what a lot of people worry about most, actually it's the people quietly self-neglecting at home that are probably at the highest risk of, um, of early mortality. And this is some more some recent work, just kind of pie charts of the contributions to the loss of life expectancy by different causes of death, and the overall thing and sort of message there is that there's a lot of different reasons for it and it's not sort of one single issue um, but it's, it's a multitude of different um, healthcare inequalities that probably contribute to that which again needs kind of picking apart further and then we've been able to look at um, individual disorders in this case we link to local cancer records um, and um, 
this is a bit small, but it, it basically the message of this is that people with mental disorders, if they get cancer, they don't actually present late. We thought that they might. We thought that their cancer might have been more advanced when they get diagnosed. It doesn't seem to be the case. And yet they still have higher uh, mortality, worse survival after the cancer diagnosis, which then you make, means that you wonder about the quality of care received, how well people um, engage in cancer treatments and, and that sort of thing. Um, Incidence of cancer doesn't seem to be particularly higher either. So we know that cancer mortality is high in people with mental disorders, but it doesn't seem to be because they're more likely to get cancer, and it doesn't seem to be because they present late. It seems to be much more to do with whatever happens once you've got the cancer and what happens to you after that. And again, needs you know that can then sort of lead on to picking that apart a bit further. And simply having a person working in data linkage um, has been enormously helpful um, just to kind of make get those the negotiations underway so that both sides um, are happy with the arrangement and happy to do that. And this that's just an example of looking at people with learning disabilities and being admitted to hospital with respiratory diseases, with chest infections, the fact that it's a higher risk and they have worse, um, they have longer lengths of stay and generally worse outcomes which again is, a, is an important public health issue for that particular patient population. And we've you've been able to use hospital records to define the people um, that we treat with severe psychotic disorders, the women who have become pregnant. So that means that we can identify pregnancy episodes from the childbirths and then look at what happens to women, you know, whether you should continue on treatment, whether you should stop the treatment when you're pregnant, whether that's, you know, whether it's, because some of these have sort of potential worries about the health of the infant um, on these treatments, and yet the last thing you want is someone to relapse into a severe mental illness um, during pregnancy, because that's not a good idea either. Very little evidence generally in this, but, but through this large database, we've been able to define really quite large um, samples of at different times in order to see what happens to their medication in a naturalistic way and what happens afterwards. That's ongoing um, research. Um, and then that's just a sort of table that we've put together recently on the most common general hospital admission reasons for people with mental disorders. Uh, chronic renal failure comes up at the top, it seems to be, but it's only driven by about 22 people having a lot of dialysis episodes. So it's a very small number, accounting for enormous numbers of hospitalizations that are about sort of twice as high as, as it should be. So in terms of what actually we want out of a healthcare big database, what, what do you want to do? Well, the, the real advantage in research, at least, is being able to see lots of people receiving um, routine interventions that one gets in, in, in any healthcare, in this case, mental health care, what, and then what happens to people afterwards. There's really no other research type of research study that is able to, to do that. So we, we run randomized trials in order to test whether a drug works or not. Um, and those are big things. But that only tests whether or not it treats the disorder. It doesn't say who gets better. And also the trial samples are usually rather selected people. So we don't really know much about actually what happens when that new medication starts being used more in routine practice with people who are perhaps a bit less healthy than they were in the trial sample and as it moves forward. And, and drug safety monitoring, obviously, a trial isn't geared up to do. It's just too small. So we know actually that you know there have been you know, periodically they turn up sort of um, from thalidomide onwards, they turn up to be sort of major drug safety issues. They won't ever be picked up right at the start because the people receiving the drugs at the beginning are never, um, you know, they're, they're, they're healthy, they're um, fit, and it's rare for side effects to occur in that group. But once the, once the medication starts being used in the general population, then, and, and information starts accruing, then you start seeing things. And without healthcare databases, we would have no information on that without any way of monitoring um, for side effects, for adverse events, particularly the more rare and severe ones. Um, you know, the, the, these types of databases are essential. So you want, to know, you want to know who gets what and what happens to them afterwards, basically, and you also want to know a bit about um, the people getting medication, whether they're older or younger, but also what, what it's being given for and, and the context. The difficulty is from the record alone, and from the, particularly in mental health care, uh, we have very, very little information that's pre-available for uh, research use. 
We don't tend to fill out sort of tick boxes much. Most information goes in big blocks of text, in, in letters to GPs, and, um, and that's actually where we, you know, what, what the information that we really want. So linkages provide extra information on other disorders, physical health outcomes, that sort of thing. But they don't provide much about um, what we really want to know. And so, hence the second sort of um, program of work, really, to develop this resource has been in, in natural language processing, because so much of our information is in text fields, particularly in mental health care. Uh, we really have to look for it somehow. And so we've worked over quite a few years now, particularly with the University of Sheffield in this area. Um, MMSE is stands for Mini Mental State Examination, and it's a score out of 30 that's routinely administered in dementia care. So if someone comes in with Alzheimer's disease, you know, they might sort of score 25 out of 30 at the beginning, but then they'll be followed through and it'll drop to 20 out of 30 or 15 out of 30 or whatever. And there'll be, regularly rec there'll be regular records of those scores. We have a field in which doctors and nurses can put in those scores in the record, but they don't. Um, and, and they don't like to, and they write it in the letters, because that's what they need to do. That's what they want to write to the GP and say, his score today was 20 out of 30, and six months ago it was you know, 26 out of 30, so it's been a clear drop. So in, in that particular analysis there, um, we, eight, eight, we had 8,500 scores um, from this particular structured field compared to 77,000 in the text um, searching for them. So the logical thing was let's build a program just that, acid, that extracts those scores out of the text, which is what we did, which is the first thing we did when we began collaborating with Sheffield, which just basically works out um, what the score was, what date it referred to, whether it's recorded as today they were this or six months ago they were this, um, and what and what that sort of um, that sort of timing issue. That meant that we could do um, a very large-scale project of people receiving routine treatment for Alzheimer's disease. There are three, four drugs that are around that are used for treatment, um, which allowed us to assemble 2,500 people with about 10,000 scores between them and sort of plot out the graph of what happened to those scores. And that sort of point at zero, sort of about a third along, is the point where people started treatment. So they were declining, the treatment benefited a bit, and then they went down again, which is almost exactly what you'd see in a trial of those treatments. So that's what we know, that they give you about nine or 12 months sort of window of stabilization, but not, not very long, and then it sort of continues down. But that may be enough for people to sort of stay at home for a bit longer and, um, and give people a bit of extra quality of life. Um, and these are widely used uh, treatments. But not only that, but we were able to look at, well, who benefits most? And this is just an example, but looking at people who received another type of medicine, well, they seem to be, they, their, their decline was sort of worse, and they had less of a sort of benefit from these treatments, which is um, not unsurprising. But that's, that's where the database particularly comes in, is to kind of look not only at um, whether the treatment has a benefit in, in routine care, but also who benefits more than other people, and can one do something about that? Um, and then from that, we've developed really a sort of very large number of different sort of um, uh, text mining applications. Uh, we have to look for most of our medication in the text because, again, there's a structured field that people don't use it very well. They tend to record most of the medication advice in letters to the doctor, to GPs and the like. Um, and, and just being able to do that enables us to, I won't go through the details of these graphs too much, that's showing that there's a particular treatment for schizophrenia which is actually given to the most severe people and yet it's surprisingly associated with quite a lot of reduced mortality. People who do receive it um, seem to be unexpectedly um, much less likely to have um, early death, uh, which, is, which is an interesting one. Um, and cannabis is known to be extremely important in people's outcome in schizophrenia, whether or not they're using cannabis or not. You won't know that from a, from a health record in its unmodified form. It's all recorded somewhere, but it's, it's recorded in text fields. And simply being able to kind of ascertain that opens up a lot of um, important research there. And we've been doing the same on social media. This is just looking at a, 
these legal highs that occur where new substances get used in the clubs and, and when they need sort of monitoring because people who use them have a way of turning up for mental health services a while later. Methadrone was, was one of these, quite a common one. And this is just plotting out the sort of spikes and where it sort of began, at bang, began being mentioned in our record or began being mentioned on Twitter, began being mentioned on Google Trends. And actually, Google and our records were actually quite a way before it ever sort of started being chatted about on Twitter, which is interesting, just again sort of thinking about whether one should be um, monitoring for um, the occurrence of these, of these agents as and when they start getting used and start getting talked about. So going back to that idea of, of knowing about the intervention and the outcome and, and why people get it, this has really been a sort of program of work over the last few years We've just been to kind of keep developing these language processing applications. Very sort of simple in concept, they're simple information extraction applications, but they need training sets derived and, and they need each developing on their own and it's been quite a lot of work, but not sort of you know, sort of methodologically terribly advanced if you're a natural language processing expert. Um, but we're beginning to sort of fill in all the gaps here, so we can now cover most of the interventions that we receive from medications into the different types of psychotherapies, um, and then also the different outcomes people might experience, but particularly a whole lot of different symptoms that people are presenting with, which is ultimately why people get these interventions. You tend to be treated for your symptoms and the diagnoses in mental health care are, are slightly less, slightly more sort of vague and less useful as, as a way of describing, you know, the, the people receiving these interventions. And we're now, I think, sort of beginning to have sort of ticked off most of those boxes and moving into sort of more advanced areas of uh, where, where it's a bit more cutting edge in terms of language processing and, and dealing with text, um, looking at particularly timing statements and what came after what and assembling events in order from a block of text about someone's past history, working out sort of then being able to put that into a sort of structured database. Um, and there's a variety of, of areas we're sort of looking to work on there, as well as the more com computational tasks of can we actually process this in real time. At the moment we run these applications and they take several days to sort of churn over the database and, and produce the new thing and every few months we do that. Um, but really, you know, there's the potential for a you know, doctor to be typing in the record and for this to be analysed at the same time as it's being typed. This is all then sort of fits into a sort of wider model of, of what we could do with this. So we begin with um, just simply having the information from the health record and being able to use that. But then we've got all the derived information from text. We can link in external database. We have a bioresource, um, meaning that routine samples are collected, so that allows the sort of biological information to come in for research as well, and that's a sort of widely expanding field. Um, and we have a, um, again, people are receiving um, care from the trust are routinely asked, would you be willing to be approached about research projects, which again allows them, that's an opt-in system, they have to kind of agree to that, um, but that allows people to be defined um, who might be eligible for particular research projects that are being run as, as part of our biomedical research center. We have the beginning of a sort of, um, a, of a shared healthcare record which allows patients and carers to put information in themselves, which is again a, a sort of going to be a feature of the NHS, I suspect, in the near future, increasing numbers of shared record platforms. We're exploring how the roles of devices and other information coming into this um, as well as taking information about sort of local um, and, and national data that might be influential. And somehow the um, challenge now is how to sort of translate that into actual applications in clinical practice. Can this actually influence what people do at, at the consultation? And just finally, we've also exported this to a number of other, other trusts as well. So we've got a network now of people using this resource. Um, just briefly towards the end, so um, this is simply just demonstrating that even with all of this, for a lot of the disorders and the sort of type of research we want to do, there are still sort of fundamental difficulties. So if you're interested in dementia and what happens to someone, ideally you want to sort of track them from diagnosis onwards, 
But the specialist service will tend to see people around the diagnosis, then they discharge back to the GP, and they might see people intermittently if there are problems arising in between. Um, general hospital might see someone much more towards um, the end of the condition where it starts getting more severe. In general practice, someone is theoretically in contact all the way through, but the information is rather sort of sparse, doesn't tend to get sort of recorded in a very routine way. GPs don't tend to um, record much about sort of dementia. So there's a question of can we actually populate the, the gaps? Um, could we you know, put devices in people's homes to sort of monitor how people are doing, possibly with a view to early intervention if someone starts um, declining a lot um, rather than waiting for the crisis to occur and everything to, you know, to sort of be predictably awful? Could we actually get in there early and prevent it? Um, or could we actually use um, the information supplied by carers. So I think I'll skip through one or two because uh, incentives is the real important thing here for devices and, and this why would anyone provide that information? Why would they have a device at home? There needs to be some reason and some good clinical reason and I think that's, that's the key thing um, in moving forward in that area. I think I'll cut there. This is just a, another example of possible intervention or possible um, the sort of thing we could do with, with data. This is looking at stigmatizing um, material on social media about schizophrenia in that case. Um, and we're, what we're doing is sort of analyzing whether actually at a time of high stigma out there on, in, the news, in the news media or in social media, um, you know, are there, are there therefore more likely are people with the disorder more likely to present or have crises? Because it's sort of understandable if they did. So we have kind of regular pollen count monitoring in asthma, and you can, you know, you can, if you have asthma, you can know what the pollen count is, and you can adjust your lifestyle accordingly for that day. Well, perhaps, you know, these clinical teams might want to have a stigma monitor, where they know that actually there's a lot of stigma going around at the moment, it's a period because there's some bad news story or other, um, and the people coming into clinic today might be feeling worse because of it. Um, so might that be a way that we, we could sort of um, develop in that direction? Uh, this is my final slide, which is really just to make both to kind of as acknowledgement of the very large number of people now who um, contribute to all of this, but also to emphasize where I think in healthcare informatics um, and, and data use in healthcare, it's a team effort. Um, there's no one person that sort of covers this discipline. Um, I don't know really the first thing about computer science, but I do know quite a lot about mental health care. Um, I need my computer science colleagues, I need my administrative colleagues to keep the show on the road, I need researchers to do the work, um, and we need our oversight and governance team to kind of make sure that we're sort of doing things appropriately and that's kept on the road, and everything else besides. Quite a lot of time people in healthcare at least, get faced with a big database and they say, oh, what we need is an informatician. And I'm never too sure what they actually mean by that because actually what they need is a team um, because that's really about the only thing that sort of enables this um, to move forward. Um, I think that's yeah, so that's my last slide. Thanks very much. Thank